Friday. Here's some for E as well. The one on the top here is one of the ways that you can define E. What makes a field more likely to have an unbalanced gender distribution? So this can be like, in the case of this paper, gyrification or brain folds. A neuroscientist started to look at the brain of uh, like I, I, I want to say this, but basically, I'm it's very very incredibly negative. negative. Uh, not Hi everyone, I'm Max Manning and today I'm going to be presenting on brain anatomy alterations associated with social networking site use disorders. I'm going to be using social networking site and SNS interchangeably throughout this talk. First, let's just talk about what categorizes an SNS use disorder. This is categorized as the inability to pull oneself away from a social networking site and the recurring behavior of returning to the app. Now that we have that settled, let's just get into why I want to present on this. As many of you know, specifically these people in the front rows, I spend a lot of time on my phone, um, namely 7 hours and 14 minutes a day. And 41 hours of that, 41 and a half, was on Battle Bay, which is a game I'm very passionate about. And I play, <laughs> I play for four, four and a half hours a day, about, which is an absurd amount. So I just you know, knowing myself, I know I have an addictive personality, addictive personality, and I wanted to learn more about what happens neurologically within my brain that causes me to be addicted to these apps. So as I started downloading some certain social media apps, namely Snapchat and Instagram, I wanted to know like, how I can control my own usage so that I don't get drawn into them too much. I know that the algorithm behind social media is designed to draw and keep people in. This is because there's no starting point or no ending point to social media. There's always a constant stream of content that you can keep scrolling through, and because it keeps you at like this balance between full, full um, satisfaction and not satisfaction at all, you never really have a chance to be told to get out of the app. You're never gonna reach fully satisfaction because they're gonna sparse out the videos that they know you really like, with videos that they know you may not like. So you're just scrolling for a long time. And I know that I'm very good at getting stuck in these algorithms, since I do often chase the easy dopamine. I go for what makes me happy first. That's um, pretty common among most people, but maybe even more so for me. And over the summer, after I got back from a month-long research intensive, I probably spent around six to eight hours a day on YouTube Shorts. And I felt like it did severely inhibit my social life and my ability to be productive in my life. So I know that... Because of all of this, I just wanted to make sure that I knew how to use these apps before I did start using them. And here's just a few uh, headlines from newspapers that, um, that outline how the social media algorithm is addictive. And because this is the intention of social media, because the algorithm is designed in this way to keep you in it, it's important to talk about um, social media addictions as use disorders, not addictions, because they are very different. And the main contrast is that addictions are much worse than, social, uh, than use disorders, uh, characterized by three things. three things. First of all, and association. Secondly, seeking. And third of all, withdrawal effects. With social media, there are, the, the dependency isn't as bad because you don't associate it with anything. They send mass numbers of push notifications all the time. And this way, you don't really have a chance to associate social media with a certain location. As you do with, namely, other addictive substances such as alcohol, if you often drink a lot on your own, you're more prone to drinking a lot on your own when you are alone. Secondly, seeking. <clears throat> when you are addicted to a substance, you will often go to measures um, that can be dangerous or just questionable to get that substance. If you have an addictive substance taken away from you, such as, I'll use alcohol again, you are more likely to take drastic measures to get the substance to consume it because it makes you much happier. And with social media, we don't really see that as much. People that were surveyed about this reported that, they, that when their social networking sites were removed from them, when they were taken away, they didn't actually go to drastic measures to find it. Um, third of all is withdrawal effects. Um, it goes without a given that you know, removing yourself from an addictive substance such as alcohol, heroin, other addictive drugs has pretty bad withdrawal effects. We've covered this in all of our drug ed classes. I'm sure many of you guys have had this before. And with social media, it is not also that way. In ninth grade, I was very addicted to my phone. Um, Colin can preach on the fact that I was on Discord for a very long time. And when I was forced to, take my, to remove myself from my phone for three weeks, I would actually say that I was much happier with myself during the three weeks in Alaska backpacking. And that just kind of goes to show that the withdrawal effects are not as bad. So I did want to learn about the neurological factors that led to my inability to remove myself from these apps. I was working on my Science Friday presentation last night while playing Battle Bay on two different phones. So 
I will say, I did want to find a way to, you know, maybe remove myself from this gaming addiction, possibly, although I still really enjoy it. Um, these are the three major parts of the brain affected by substance addictions, which is what the study aims to identify and to research throughout the course of the study. First of all is the amygdala. The amygdala is generally seen as the reward center of the brain and can lead to dependency. The amygdala is a part of the limbic system which helps define and regulate your emotions. And the amygdala is often what leads to dependency. When you, there's a certain amount of dopamine that you can produce naturally. And when you can produce an addictive substance, it actually allows you to produce more dopamine than you naturally can. Meaning that when you are not using the substance, you are not really able to reach satisfaction levels of happiness that you can with the substance. And as you use the substance more and more, you will become um, more toned to using that substance. So your brain will start to produce more dopamine as you consume that substance more and more, meaning that you just gain an even higher dependency. Second is the mid-singulate cortex and the anterior cingulate cortex, so the MCC, ACC. These contribute to cognitive, con uh, cognitive control and decision making. This is the, um, like the seeking part of it, because the MCC, ACC, is what tells you to whether you pick up your phone or you go out with your friends. And it's part of being able to disconnect yourself from something you're using at the moment and to go to switch to something else. This is why, for me, it's hard to play video games and then do homework, because it's been toned to play video games. And finally is a nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is the neural interface between motivation and action. It actually does a similar thing to the MCC ACT, although the nucleus accumbens is actually also connected to the limbic system, limit system, and releases dopamine when you are using a substance that you enjoy. And it is also what helps you decide between whether you are going to motivate yourself to do something or you're just going to take the easy dopamine. And here's just a map of where they are on the brain in case anybody's, serious, uh, anybody's curious. Now, let's move on to gray matter volume. Gray, gray matter volume is the way that my study, or the study that I read, um, talked about and quantified changes within these parts of the brain. Gray matter volume is, comp is composed of neuronal cell bodies and unmyelinated axons, which are all important for cerebral functioning. When you have a lot of gray matter in your volume, typically there, is too, there can be too much and there can be too little, but it typically allows your brain to function better. So having more gray matter volume is good. However, there is a um, natural biological process called gray matter volume pruning. And this is when your brain will remove unnecessary and unneeded synapses that are just like unnecessary links that can actually inhibit your brain's ability to function. And by pruning these, you allow your brain to function more effectively. Just a quick example of this is that during puberty, your brain will prune around 1% of its gray matter volume each year. And let's just go into the novelty of study. Why is this study different from other studies studying addiction and use disorders? Um, unlike many of the studies, the study that I will be telling you about today talks a lot about how the structural changes in these three parts of the brain actually change during the development of a social media use disorder. It doesn't necessarily talk about cell death. It talks about the gray matter volume changes, which is an important distinction because it's not saying that your brain actually just like dies when you develop a use disorder, but it actually structurally changes. And just a quick note before we get into the data and everything is that Facebook was the only site used for this study. So it will be difficult to extrapolate to other social media sites, such as Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat, which all function in a very different manner. Now, the study design. There were 50 participants involved in the study. They all filled out a survey that outlined some of their basic demographics and their use disorder level from what they believed it was to be. And they all consented to an MRI scan. And when the researchers took an MRI scan of all these people, they looked at the gray matter volume that was present in each of the parts of these brain across a period of time. And their demographics were that they were 20.3 years old on average, either in college or just out of college. <coughs> They had 4.7 years of usage on the app, which is Facebook. Um, they had 743 connections, and they had 8.4 uses per day. This is not to be confused with the amount of time that they use it. It's just that they logged on 8.4 different times per day. Um, and now let's move into the data. These are the graphs. Um, on the x-axis, we have the social networking site addiction score. On the y-axis, we have the GMV and the ACC-MCC. This shows here that when you prune the ACC-MCC, when you take gray matter volume away, you actually have a lower social networking site use disorder score. This positive association between both of them shows that as your ability to make cognitive decisions goes up, so does your social networking site, or your social networking site use disorder score. Yeah? Can you just do that again slower one time? All right. So as your ability to make cognitive decisions goes up, as seen on this graph, um, it's a positive association. It shows that your social networking site use disorder score actually goes up as well, showing that 
when there is more GMV, when the agency entity is able to function more effectively, your um, ability to become, quote unquote, addicted to these sites goes up. Moving on to the amygdala. <clears throat> there is actually a negative association between these two, or between or the left and right amygdala. Um, and the amygdala, just to repeat, is kind of the reward center and dopamine release of um, the brain. When there is less GMV in the amygdala, your social networking site score goes up. And this shows that you actually build a dependency on these, app, or on these apps for um, dopamine release, although it is not as high as those produced from alcohol and other addictive substances. And for the nucleus accumbens, there was no graph for this, as the results were largely insignificant and could be attributed to other factors. Now, to move on to the conclusion, what does this data all mean? First of all, there are several important similarities and differences between social networking site use disorders and substance addictions. First of all, they both exhibit similar GMV structural changes in the amygdala, which means that they, since we saw a negative association between the two, it shows how you actually build a dependency on these for happiness, so meaning that you produce more dopamine when you use these um, substances, and that is higher than the amount of dopamine you can naturally produce when not using these substances. However, unlike drugs and alcohol um, and other addictive substances, social networking site use disorders show an opposite, um, they show an opposite association between the two, between GMV changes within the MCC-ACC. And just to reiterate, the MCC-ACC, the mid cingulate cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, controls your, con uh, your cognitive decision making. Um, and this is really important because it shows how when you use social networking sites uh, for long periods of time and develop a use disorder, your ability to make cognitive decisions is not necessarily impaired. In fact, the data actually shows that it goes up, which is opposite to when you use a lot, when you drink a lot of alcohol or you're high or whatever, you're, where your ability to make informed decisions is actually inhibited. This is kind of why they tell you don't drink and drive, or if you're drunk, you might find out that you did some really weird stuff because you're not able to critically think about your decisions. So because of all of this, it all shows that social networking sites should, and these use disorders should not be classified as an addiction or compared to other illicit substance use or addictions because they are inherently very different because of your ability to make cognitive decisions. Um, and just to move on to the future work, why should we, what should we do from all this? What does this all mean in the long run? Well, just because our generation is the first generation to be growing up with social media, we've never seen any form of social networking paralleled to the amount that we see nowadays. We see how you can connect to pretty much anybody at random just with a click. You can see what everybody else is doing pretty much instantly. And it will be really interesting to see what happens to our generation and what happens because of these rapid advances in technology. Secondly, it will be interesting to do some more research on how the nucleus accumbens is affected by a use disorder as the results were largely inconclusive. And for me, maybe I will try to not play Battle Bay as much. Although it does seem clear that it actually makes my ability to make cognitive decisions go up. Thank you for listening to my talk.